Welcome to the Urban Real Estate Research Unit and COIN Online quarterly seminar. These are seminars that we do throughout the, the year where we look at very specific real estate issues. What we're doing today is looking at prop tech, but not just prop tech, but the relationship and the embeddedness of prop tech in the real estate business in South Africa. We have some great panelists with, with uh, us um, who will be taking us through uh, their presentations. And then after that, we will have our panel discussion. Um, very critical to our thinking here, which uh, and our partner at Coin Online is that we look at topics that we are really thinking about at the moment and which we think will transform the South African property market over the next uh, few years. Enjoy the presentations and the panel discussions uh, afterwards. So today I'll be talking about implementing property tech uh, in South Africa. I think we'll, I initially want to start with looking at you know, how the overall property tech landscape looks and then drill down into some specific examples. Um, you know, in zooming out, you, we kind of want to think about the prop tech sector more generally and also how it's demonstrating how it's maturing over a period of time. Um, and I think this increasing level of maturity means that it's also differentiating itself um, from other types of, of technology. Um, and so what we're starting to see is this creation of sub-genres um, within the property tech space. So for example, we were very focused on the shared economy things like Airbnb and WeWork for the longest time. Um, but actually what we're realizing that there's quite a specific subset now that exists within prop tech. But its creation as a subset has taken a while. It means that there's some maturity that's been occurring in the in the landscape. We're seeing it differentiating itself from sort of smart real estate, the internet of things um, within that space. Construction technology is also slightly different in that most of that in, in the prop tech space at least is focused on building information systems and how to use that to improve project management for building delivery. Um, and so that means that we can start thinking about property technology itself as something slightly different. Um, Within the arena now, you're starting to see this differentiation happen. And, and one of the ways that they're looking at it is the sort of search, supervise, and sell um, uh, disaggregation. But what, what we are noticing is that as things mature and as new tools get rolled out, we're also seeing that these start breaking down. The, the way that we're understanding what search is is different. For example, search is not necessarily buy um, in, in a model like this. And so we're trying to understand how does how do how do the sort of the buying platforms that we're using for tech um, or that owners are using now, how do they integrate into these types of frameworks in the way that we, we're thinking about tech? Um, the last one is maybe to just draw a, a, quite a big distinction between the technology that is being used on residential and technology that is being used on commercial because there's a vast difference here on, on I guess, two metrics. The one is that there is a much larger volume of residential buyers and sellers out there, and so the technology is adapting for them um, to, to a large extent. And the second is that with, I think with this sort of larger pool of people, you now also have a larger pool of people pushing the technology to a different level. And so you see a different type of adoption than what you would see in commercial real estate tech. Um, and that's where we really are focused. Um, but it is, it's quite a niche space now if you start thinking of it in the context of this entire sort of, um, you know, where's prop tech in tech, what types of areas are we involved in, and now we're only talking about commercial real estate. So it's a very specific area. Um, but even in this space, there is a lot happening. Um, there's a plethora of firms that are operating in all sorts of subsectors in the, in the property tech space. Um, and so... It's, and these are mostly for the European and US markets right now, and, and COIN will be issuing one for, for the South African market, a, a sort of a analysis of the property tech lands, landscape um, within the country. And so, you know, how are we at COIN looking at our property technology solutions and what we think property tech should be doing uh, in general in, in the country? I think. For us, we really are trying to just solve pain points. We're all property people working. We, we're property people that have learned tech um, in order to solve problems that we've experienced within, um, within running our businesses. And so 
really fundamentally what we focus on is trying to decrease the amount of time that is spent by managers and by owners on on sort of repetitive admin intensive tasks and we, we're trying to find ways to create those operational efficiencies by making sure that we can cut out unnecessary processes or, or make certain processes much quicker um, where we are able to. So in the when we think about it from the operational side, it's really just about solving sort of productivity questions. Um, I think when we look at it from a market inefficiency, we, we're trying to understand, well, how can we get a property to sell quicker in the market? How can we get a listing, a vacancy listing in your building to, to get to market quickly? And how are we able to make sure that that transacting process is as seamless as possible and is as quick as possible? Um, and I think, you know, as we as we start seeing more and more of these systems come online, not only our own, but with, within the sort of wider industry that's now maturing, we also need to see how the integration between these systems are going to is going to work. Um, and so, for example, when we think of our, our, our sort of vacancy management operating system, uh, I want to just talk about how it ties into these different sort of solving some of these pain points. And I guess on the on the operational inefficiencies, it's really what we're trying to do is automate systems for to a large extent. So, for example, the linking a live API into the property management system, which it draws the vacancies from for us is very important. We only want to use our tech to be able to enhance what is not present in current systems. Um, and I guess once it's sort of gone through the market, once your listing has gone through our vacancy management system to, you know, we've enhanced the listing with pictures, with descriptions and other things. We want to get it to the market as quickly as possible. Once we do have a tenant, what we want to do is automate the rest of the process again. We want to make sure that you can auto, you have an automated feature that, uh, that can be done by, by your tenant and by the owner. Um, that we also be able to auto-populate the offers to lease within the right formats, using the right templates for, for different businesses. And then sort of taking it through this e-signature integration, making sure that you can sign online. And, and these are already developed now, but we're sort of starting to think about the next steps um, that we need to get to, which is around how do we negotiate these leases online? Um, how do we sort of play it between the tenant and, and owner as they need to be negotiated? How do we make sure that we can, we can do that as quickly and as accurately as possible? Um, and then just try to sort of automate it back into the system. And so for us, this integration now becomes a, a, a sort of a huge, huge issue, um, especially when, when we're starting to develop more and more, um, more and more systems. Our sales OA system is very similar, except that you know, system integration here is not as important um, because you, you sort of, you're selling a property from one, um, from one system into another system with a different owner. So it becomes slightly less of an issue. But, we are still trying to deal, making sure that we get it as efficient to the market as efficiently as we possibly can. Um, we we also want to make sure that a an owner who is managing the the sort of sales process is able to do so as quickly and efficiently as possible um, by managing brokers, by making sure that there's very accurate and accurate information in the system, but that you, you're representing your property as best as what you can um, within, this, um, within this ecosystem. And we see people use it for different, for different tasks. So for example, uh, we have an ESCOM portfolio that is being sold at the moment, and the ESCOM, in, in sort of using our technology to sell it, is focused more on how that technology is able to control the flow of information through a due diligence process, what information goes out to market at which points. Um, I think also the ability to manage a set of brokers nationally um, across every province in every possible jurisdiction um, is quite important. But being able to do all of this and being able to sort of maximize the price at the same time. Um, and, and I guess for an SOE, also just making sure that there's a traceability and an auditability that is built into the system um, that becomes very useful for them. And for us, you know, that, that's how we solve these types of operational inefficiencies and very specific inefficiencies that may operate um, even in, in, in different types of property owning um, entities. Um, so what we're seeing recently is, is this sort of real big uptick in, in e-signature and the demand for e-signature, and which is why we've integrated it uh, into our system now. But, but digital signatures is just one example of, of a, a sort of a broader need for integration. You know, we, there was this push to be able to do listings for a long time and making sure that the marketplaces were working. And now people are starting to see how that needs to integrate into the processes into the internal processes um, and so we're getting this 
you know, the, the sort of proliferation of systems now, but what what we're trying to do is just make it a seamless, um, make that sort of lease signature um, and leasing process as seamless as possible. Um, and so we had, you know, we had started with a very simple system that, that we were trying to create. Uh, like we manage vacancies, we market it out, we get a tenant, we're able to fika and verify them, and then we sign this um, offer to lease and, and, and off we go. Um, but what we're actually starting to notice is all these operational bottlenecks um, that our clients are experiencing. We're starting to say, wait, hold on, we, we do need to add different modules to it. We now need to make sure that those modules are also integrated into, um, into the broader system. And so our, it's, this idea of being sort of integrated and seamless is, is, is sounds trite, but it's actually really important for us um, and, and is becoming increasingly important for, for, our, for our clients. And so we, the idea that we're forming is a sort of needing to close the loop um, in the sense that you need to be pulling from a system of record into your other systems and then being able to, you know, either through an e-signature and online lease negotiation process, you need to be able to auto-populate back into that system of record so that we can close the loop as, as seamlessly as possible, that there's as few areas of uh, potential inaccuracy um, in the system as what we, uh, what we can possibly get to. Um, and then, you know, I guess all of this sort of informs how it is that we're thinking of, of emerging areas of work in, in SA. Uh, we've talked about the digital contracting and e-signing. We think this is going to become standard uh, within the next two or three years. Um, you, e-signature should be standard now for most people, um, and we're now starting to see that, um, that need for online lease negotiation. I think the integration of sort of um, Internet of Things, the creation of smart buildings means that we're going to have to monitor and manage buildings very differently. Um, and we're starting to see some of that emerge, especially in the environmental monitoring space in, in SA, but it is going to become, it's going to need to become a lot more smarter than that um, in the next couple of years. I think fractional real estate investments is, is taking a hold now, especially in, in the hospitality area. Um, we've seen versions of this in South Africa in, in, in previous years, but it's now that that sort of fractional ownership is going down to much smaller and smaller levels as technology allows us to to implement that those types of volumes where, where you can think about um, a resident in a low income community being able to own a portion of the shopping center that is in the um, that is in the neighborhood that theoretically it is possible the technology allows for it and it, it, it may be a, a solution to some sort of growing um, savings problems in, in SA. In, in the US this is mostly focused on neighborhood level um, investments that people then also that residents then buy into um, and it's a way of creating a sense of community of owning your community. Um, we on, on the sort of process of software development we've seen a period now where um, many firms have tried to develop software in-house, um, property firms that is, um, to, with some successes and, and without. I think it is difficult uh, for, for property companies to do this in-house, it's not their core business. Um, I think it also means that uh, trying to do it in-house creates a scalability problem um, where you may be solving a problem for your specific firm and paying the development fees, but an external firm uh, may be able to do that work and even better work simply because they have the scalability and they're willing to invest because they have so much, so many more clients um, than what an individual firm uh, has. Um, I think on the big data, this is the last point, is that there's, you know, we've been talking about big data and I think we've thought about it in South Africa to a large extent around um, the automation of valuations and creating more precision around valuations. But in fact, there are there's so many larger applications of it uh, in terms of how we allocate our assets within firms um, and also between firms when you think you're on a portfolio level within South Africa um, and how we're using and developing that market intelligence for ourselves. Um, so for example, on our, our vacancy platform now and our the coin marketplace, what we are able to do is look at all the listings that are on there and start analyzing that data in real time. And that's something that we weren't able to do five or six years ago. We didn't have the computing technology for it. We now we do. Um, and so I think how asset managers and owners are gonna consume data or a market data is gonna become very different. And hopefully, if we are able to solve some of the operational inefficiencies um, that they're dealing with, they have more time to be able to consume information that's actually going to benefit their portfolios. Um, and so I'll leave it there. Um, thank you. 
Wayne asked me to talk today about uh, work agility and how we had to adapt it uh, to meet the requirements of a prop tech solution. Actually, we didn't approach it that way because I'm not a prop tech person at the end of the day. We rather looked at what do we think our clients' needs are and what's the best thing that could help us fulfill that need. So that's what we looked at. I think another important aspect to, to consider is change because a tech solution is something that is different to what we do at the moment. And uh, I think we need to be open and available to consider that change as well. Somebody once said, when you think of a new concept, you must uh, make sure that the total addressable market is well, the whole market. You must be first. You must take something everyone complains about and definitively and unambiguously fix it. Make sure the product sells itself, because if it requires a huge advertising campaign, well then it isn't a world beater. And then don't rest on your laurels, keep on improving it. And I suppose that's the kind of process and mindset we had with uh, Work Agility. In fact, those comments come from uh, Steve Jobs when he developed the Apple iPhone. When we consider our market, changes have been happening in the market. Uh, in the office portfolio, we have about 79% of our clients who occupy less than a thousand square meters. The relevance of that is they haven't got big HR departments necessarily and they really are individuals and organizations who just want to get on and do their work. So they have particular needs. Average lease lengths have been getting shorter and when we last checked the average period is 2.9 years. They used to be five years, used to be longer and I mean it has direct impact on the next thing which we mentioned here which is your tenant installation contribution. So fit-out allowances are usually one uh, month's rent for each year of the lease. And fit-outs have been getting more expensive over time. So I was actually quite surprised when I worked it out. It actually works out to only 7.2% of the total cost of a fit-out. Clients want service. They want a sense of community. They want to belong. Um, employers need to make it easier for their staff to come back to the office. That's certainly something that is coming to the fore more and more. Uh, you can't be like Elon Musk and demand that you come back to work. You've got to make it an attractive uh, proposition. And you know, employers who are focusing on their, on, their, on their business, they need help from their landlord. Some organizations are embracing hybrid work, so that means you need to change uh, uh, your offering uh, to be able to accommodate that. And then one of the things that we were experiencing was vacancies were, were growing. And that was something before COVID. Um, so that's something you need to respond to. There's some... Viktor Frankl said, when you're no longer able to change a situation, uh, we're challenged to change ourselves. And then when you consider the need, Henry Ford said, if you'd ask people what they wanted, they would have said, oh, we want to foster horses. Um, and it really isn't about lower rentals. It's about responding to that need and making something better. You can't just hope that people will come back to the office. You need to adapt and change your strategy. I think it starts with a purpose. Uh, work agility has a purpose and really the focus is to create an efficient environment for companies to take care of their employees so they can work effectively and productively. Uh, I think it's Graham Codrington talks about using your workspace as a tool and where is the best place where you can work. So we need to facilitate that. So yeah, I've listed the, the, the important elements of, of work agility. It focuses, uh, is, is on the client and it's their own brand and their own identity. Uh, it's a complete fit out of a dedicated office space with Wi-Fi included. It's, a, it's presenting them with a very simple choice. If I was the owner of a business, all I want to know is how many seats do I need to occupy my employees and what's the fixed monthly cost that I need to uh, budget for and provide for. The other process is a flexible one-click lease agreement. If I can book an Airbnb building uh, in other geographies, why can't I do a simple uh, lease agreement. Need a frictionless credit check and signing process, making it very easy for people move in and move out. We talk about availability of amenities. It's not something traditionally available, but it's something we can offer and make available. We need uh, efficient loading uh, onto our system. We happen to use MRI. And uh, the costing needs to work at the end of the day. So if you look at those, that list of all the different elements of what's required, What's the best tool we can use in order to fulfill that requirement? And here I've just highlighted this is where PropTech comes in. Because in each of these elements, uh, uh, this is where PropTech was the best solution to fulfill all of those needs. So if we, 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 we look at it, if I talk about the simplicity, uh, if you show somebody a space, it looks like that. And you can say there's your TI allowance and you can go fit out your space and that's a conventional fit out. 
Or you can actually offer them this and say, right, you can move in. There it's fitted out. It's the exact same thing. And uh, it's just how many desks are there and, uh, and uh, how much do I need to pay each month. It's a far simpler type of way of looking at it. We don't talk about GLAs. Uh, and TI allowances and occupation certificates and things that really are not your business um, that you want to deal with. Here's an example of a layout. You can see the configuration deals with open desks, various meeting rooms of various sizes, including those private rooms that you need for Zoom discussions and things like that. Um, here's actually a picture of a completed space, uh, uh, which, uh, which we've done, which shows the different elements. So it really is a light, bright, and a nice place to be at the end of the day. If you look at the next elements uh, we, we, we talk about here, we talk about a one-click lease agreement and being able to present with simple choice. And so here PropTech uh, comes to the fore, where if you have a website where you show the space that is available, so if you go to Work Agility, you'll see it's very simple at the end of the day. You go through the available properties, and if you click uh, uh, on the process, it indicates you really do a property search online, you book a tour, come and look at it, you get what you see, and if you like it, it's actually quite easy to secure your space. Here's the one for Newlands on Main at the top. You'll see how we present the information. It's presented as a, yeah, we indicate the size, but it's really the number of seats and the monthly rental is what people want to say, uh, want to see. Um, as far as the process is concerned, uh, it's again fairly simple. We have copies of all the documentation, fact sheets and things like that. And if you want to secure your space, you literally click that button over there where it says secure your space. And then you're led through a very uh, uh, friendly but automated process at the end of the day. From this step in a conventional lease, it could sometimes take weeks and it's extensive documentation to get to the point. Let me take you through the process here. So the first thing is we obviously need to check your FICA uh, documentation. Uh, when you enter into the system, you'll get a one-time password. You'll go into the verified system and you actually take photographs of your company documentation. Me on the landlord side, I receive a confirmation that the client is FICA compliant. The next thing, if you do want the space and you like it, you will enter into your details and it will automatically be loaded onto DocuSign. So the client will complete it and they will physically sign, uh, sign it and then that DocuSign document comes back onto my com uh, uh, computer and I'm able to, to, to check it there. The other thing is we are able to integrate, we haven't done it yet, uh, with the various TPNs and the other credit checks. So literally as a landlord I'm presented with a signed offer which is concluded on DocuSign together with the FICA uh, uh, confirmation together with the credit check below. And that happens all automatically without any other hu human intervention involved. So it's an incredibly efficient way of managing what can otherwise be a long and cumbersome process. The client can literally look at the property today and they can be in tomorrow because all the documentation has been concluded. The next aspect there where technology comes to the fore is around the availability of uh, amenities. We actually have a community manager, Yvette, she works with us and she comes from a hospitality background. But to make her effective, you need to be able to have effective communication with your clients. And in this day and age, technology really helps to create that one-on-one -on -one relationship, even on scale. So what we've created is here, this is a picture of my home screen on my computer, is what looks like an app, it's a web interface. So if you click on that, you'll be presented with this information. And the middle screen is really just the welcome, welcome to Work Agility. On the left, you have all the various contact details that we have. Uh, 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 with Yvette, you're able to make contact and connect. And importantly, on the right, we have all the various links that we would possibly want to share with you. For example, there are amenities, uh, there's events. These types of things be, uh, give one environment and one place for people to make uh, contact with us and keep that connection alive. I actually have a question there, so it's a, on the scan by uh, Meishi. Yeah. What does that do? So that's a business card, so you can actually share that with uh, uh, other people. So if I've got that here and you want to get this onto your uh, phone, you just literally scan that and then that'll be on your phone and you can ex uh, save it to your home page. You can see it. Um, yeah. Then the, the, the final aspects which are uh, important is there must be efficient uh, loading on the system. I've learned a lot recently about APIs and things like that. A lot of other people know more about it than me. But what it does mean is that 
from this platform we can efficiently load the information again without any more uh, human intervention and risk of, of mistakes onto our MRI platform which makes uh, the, the billing and the other back-end processing uh, very easy to implement. The final aspect there that I mentioned is about the cost return principle. Uh, we're able to create through this product an environment where people can sign a lease for one year um, because we know if they want to grow or change or move out, we are able to accommodate uh, the next tenant who, who, who wants this space. And so from a return perspective, we avoid that situation where people have to spend a lot of money on a fit out, all to be removed and done again for the next tenant. And so we actually end up in a situation where this monthly cost together with the other invoices you have to pay uh, if you uh, rent uh, a space directly are actually cheaper in the long run if you deal with it directly. Um, yeah, and that's the, the product that we, we've, we've produced and we've used technology to enable the process. Uh, we've certainly learned through the process because it is, it is something new and uh, it's been exciting and uh, well worth uh, the, the exercise. Um, people say nothing is impossible, but it certainly is possible if you put your mind to it. Um, I'm going to be discussing uh, integration. Integration within property technology. I'm going to be going over integration uh, as a subject as a whole. And we're going to be looking at sort of what are the different types of integration that are out there between applications. Um, the industry has been moving in a direction where we're becoming uh, more and more data centric. I'll right? be asking questions and looking for answers uh, from a larger or more complex data sets. Uh, and the way we do this essentially in the future, uh, as of now, is really looking at how solutions within an environment, within a business, can begin speaking to each other. So at a very high level, uh, there's essentially four types of integration that can take place between applications. The most common of them all uh, is what we consider application programming interface integrations, API integration. And uh, there's a, a couple of subcategories uh, for API integration. Some are pu private integration, some are public, um, some are, are, are led uh, by partners, but they all use the same, essentially the same application integration. Uh, and by establishing sort of these interconnections, uh, we use things like common product code uh, on, a, on a language level uh, to establish this integration. And what we're doing, in a nutshell, is allowing systems to seamlessly transmit data between each other, whether it's your source system, whether it's a back-end system. Um, either way, the idea is to get information from one system into another system. Now, there's a bunch of advantages for using API as the integration method. The first is that it's quite flexible, meaning that because we can use code product language specific to different products, uh, we can ensure that so can, can handle the most data variations that one could come across. Um, what else it solves for is uh, allowing for smooth operations. Uh, and this is really an operational perspective, you know, not having to leave a source system or being able to make a decision in a single system gathering data from other source systems, which is really cool. Uh, and then the other reason why API is the most common would be the fact that it, is, uh, it has the highest availability sort of, of all your integration methods. The advantages of API integration um, really makes it useful in the way of, of uh, integrating between different prop tech solutions. And not just prop tech solutions, but any solutions as a matter of fact. Uh, the disadvantages are massive, right? You still need a developer to build the middleware. Um, you still need a developer who understands the product's language code, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're looking to solve in MRI is essentially building a, an API layer as a service. And this is a brand new product. This is something we've rolled out into the North American market. But essentially what it is, is an opportunity for a company, let's say, that has a set amount of user interfaces on the front end. Let's say somebody's logging into an application like WhatsApp or working within a facilities management module inside another application. Those are all front end user experience platforms, right? That's where the user is interacting with uh, the solution or the database. And on the other side is the backend solution, the engine, where the database is sitting, where the system is doing its calculations and its logic performance. And in between that, what we are developing is an API layer as a service. And what this does is it gives an, a developer or a business the opportunity to uh, pull information from the backend solutions 
and put it into any front-end solution. So that sounds like a normal two-way integration, right? Being able to pull information up and down. The difference is, is that we have built an API layer pre-configured along with DNS and load balancing, etc., alongside a developer portal that sits to the left, to the right, to the side of the API layer. And that developer portal is provided with Swagger documentation or documentation for developers to begin creating their own customized uh, calls and, and puts and gets, et cetera, et cetera. And what really we're doing here is saying that irrespective of the solutions that you've paid for from your suppliers, irrespective of the property management solution or your credit bureau check solutions, whatever the case may be, we would like to offer as a service the API layer and its microservices. And when I say microservices, we can consider this to be like a shopping cart, for example. And generally, when you build a two-way integration, you're building it from one end to the other end of another product, right? You're going from one door to the other door, carrying information to and fro. And the difference here is that we are solving for those two main disadvantages of API integration as a method. We are saying by using the API layer and these microservices, these data cards, we could essentially take uh, points of data from any solution, put them into one single cart and carry that cart and its data off to a single front-end solution. So for example, if somebody is sitting in a management module for facilities or uh, sitting in a leasing admin space, right? Somebody's looking at a lease on the front end and a leasing module. And they could essentially, with either a hover, depending on how this is built, or a click of the button, be able to pull up not only the tenant's lease information, um, their base rental, but also things like the credit history from a credit bureau application without going into that application, logging out and going back into that application. So quite a Quite an interesting way of solving for the availability of the data, and more importantly, alongside having a set of developer portals, we then solve for the code intensity that is normally required for a developer to have to build the middleware. And so offering API layer as sort of your middleware service, uh, but across uh, products and services uh, in your ecosystem.